I'm going to count to three, then I'll get started. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Birmingham and Lewisham African and Caribbean Health Inequalities Review. Um, today, we're doing an engagement workshop and it's been run by Public Health. Can I start by giving a few house rules? Um, can I say to you that the um, camera is option, optional, it can be on or off. Can I ask you to stay muted unless you are um, talking? Can I ask you to use the chat function when you need to? And if you want to speak, can I ask you to raise your hands um, if you want to ask any questions? Please, can I also say to you, this morning is really important. So um, if you've got any questions, and you, you use the chat function, can you email your questions if you've forgotten to Joseph, I think it's called Merriman at birmingham.gov.uk. And the this webinar is going to be recorded for subsequent, you can listen to it um, subsequently. Actually, it will be shared with you in the next week. And now a little bit about Paulette before I end on. Right, my name is Paulette Hamilton and I'm the Cabinet Member for Adult Social Care and Health and I also cover this wonderful brief which is Public Health and um, the Lewisham Project um, is the creation, is the mastermind of both the Public Health Director in Lewisham and our Director in Birmingham, who through seeing quite a, 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 a lot of similarities, he came to me really excited, Dr Justin Varney, and he said, Councillor, I'd really like us to do this project. I think he'd already started preparing for it, but I'll pretend as if he waited for me to say, yes, it was a good idea. But I did think that he had a brilliant, it was a brilliant idea. And can I thank you all for all your input so far, because what you've done so far has been some excellent work and it does take quite a lot of dedication. So what I shall do now, now I've finished rambling on for a few minutes, I will hand over to, I think it's Justin. Yeah, I will hand over to Dr. Justin Varney and the event focus today will give us the event focus. So Justin, Dr. Varney, over to you. Thank you very much, Councillor Hamilton. And, and thank you also for your support around this uh, piece of work. It really has been a, a really interesting collaboration between Birmingham and Lewisham. Um, what we're going to be sharing today is the opportunities for action, the recommendations from the first three thematic uh, topics we've discussed with the advisory boards to get your feedback and to get your uh, reflections on them. Um, I should say we're going to be using Menti uh, today. So um, if you can, uh, while I'm talking, uh, just go on to mentimeter.com. What I find easiest is using my phone uh, to go to my smartphone to get mentimeter.com and then put the code in because then the voting comes up and I don't have to switch screens. But you can also use your camera on your phone and take a picture of that uh, black and white QR box and it will take you directly to the link. Um, but we'll also put it in the chat as well and it will be flagged a couple of times. Uh, when we get to the point where you need to use the Menti. Um, so I thought I'd start by just giving a bit of an overview about the Inequalities Review and what it's about and, and what we're trying to do. So Birmingham and Lewisham are in many ways very different boroughs. Um, Birmingham City Council is the largest unitary authority in the country uh, with about 1.2 million citizens. Um, Lewisham is one of 32 local authorities in London, has a much smaller population, um, but we both face similar challenges in terms of deprivation, uh, in terms of uh, the diversity of our citizens, uh, and in terms of the challenges, common challenges we share around public health and issues like obesity, mental well-being. And this came about because both Birmingham and Lewisham are 
uh, parts of a project called the Childhood Obesity Trailblazer Programme, where we're uh, working on addressing childhood obesity in innovative ways. So it happened that the Director of Public Health, uh, Catherine, and I were at an event in Birmingham together. We got talking and also the, uh, the Deputy Mayor of Lewisham was there. Uh, and one of the things we discussed was actually how frustrated we all were uh, about the use of the word of the phrase BAME to describe all ethnic groups. And actually, it was time that we did more work to really drill down to understand inequalities in the context of different ethnic communities uh, and try to really understand their unique experiences. And there may be similarities to other ethnic communities, but actually by trying to do this in a way which really looks at uh, a group of ethnic communities separately from the overall BAME group, we would get more value. And that really kind of excited us. Uh, I brought the idea back to Councillor Hamilton, who similarly, as she said, got quite excited about it. Uh, and because of the demographics in both areas, um, we decided that we would work together on this, looking at the inequalities affecting our African and Caribbean communities. And as you can see from this slide, it, the proportion of the population uh, in Birmingham uh, that identify as African, Caribbean or other black ethnicities is quite a lot lower than the proportion in Lewisham. But in absolute numbers of people, we have more people from those communities and that's part of the, the scale of Birmingham challenge. Um, so that's why we decided to work together. Um, no one's ever really done this before. Um, in this way in local government. And we really wanted to do this in a way that engaged uh, citizens, that engaged academics, that brought together different voices. So that although we, we really focus on what is the evidence base and what is the published evidence base, we were also drawing in people's lived experiences. Uh, and through the review, we would try different methods to bring out those lived experiences and engage them as well. So this is a pilot. Uh, of this methodology. Um, we have said if it works, we're likely to use it again with different communities, um, probably not in a partnership with the same authorities. We can mix and match uh, depending on the, the need, um, but it is really a learning process. And this part of the process, this public engagement is also something new. So normally what we do is we wait until we've written the recommendations and we've locked them down. Um, and then we go to public consultation and we stick that up on a website uh, and generally I have to say people don't necessarily get that excited to engage with us. And what we wanted to do this time was bring to into the public domain the opportunities for action in their draft form to share with you, to give you an opportunity to feed back on them, to input to them but also that there's a survey version, which we'll put the link in the chat and is at the end as well. So more people can get to input before they kind of get locked down into that formal consultation phase. So to give you a sense of the, um, some of the topics we're looking at, we've decided at the beginning of review, we set out a series of themes. Um, and one of the themes that we will be looking at is the role of poverty and deprivation. And if you can just go back one slide, Joe. Great, thanks. Um, we can't avoid discussing the, the reality that many of our African and Caribbean communities live in much more deprived areas. And the same is true in Lewisham. Um, and that there are common narratives, common uh, discussions that came up and continue to come up through all of the engagement. Um, but and, and we are looking at our local data alongside the published data to bring that through in the review and its recommendations. And this is just an example of what we've been able to do using the census data, which is now quite old and we'll be able to hopefully redo um, before the final report is published in the spring once we get the new updated data. Um, but if we go on to the next slide, it sets out the themes of focus. So we chose nine thematic areas to focus on and in each session we, and I'll talk about how we did it in a second, um, but these were developed jointly with Lewisham, talking to some of our local stakeholders and partners in both areas, but also reflecting what we knew from, from a kind of the early scoping of the evidence were key. 
some of these areas, there's lots of research, there's lots of published literature. Um, in other areas, there's very, very little. And one of the things we really wrestled with and we continue to wrestle with the review is that much of the research on African and Caribbean people is from America. And actually it's looking at Afro-American or African-American identities. Um, and obviously the social narrative and constructs are different in America. America for a start has a private healthcare system uh, which is based on health insurance. And that in itself creates a whole series of different barriers from what we have in the NHS. So we really wrestled and, and you'll see that come through in some of the evidence statements about whether we do include that or whether we think it's transferable or not. Um, but when you look at actually exploration of racism and discrimination in health, in the UK, it's a very, very poorly researched area. And actually through many of the theme thematic reviews that we've discussed, um, the evidence base in the UK is very poor. Um, and what we tend to see is that all ethnic groups that are non-white British are just uh, slammed together into a single group. Um, and that really becomes a bit meaningless. Um, in terms of understanding what is going on. And some of the data we'll present a bit later, I think will actually help um, elaborate that there are differences. There are differences between African and Caribbean experiences and the wider non-white British ethnic community, but actually also between African and Caribbean communities, there are quite significant differences in some areas. So today we're gonna to be focusing on the first three which we now completed the evidence review and the engagement and we'll be running similar types of engagement later in the year as we finish the next uh, six topics. So we go on to the, the next slide. This just shows you that the uh, meeting cycle when we wrote this at the beginning of course COVID wasn't about so I, I you the original plan was we would have completed this all within a year and unfortunately, the pandemic, quite understandably, has diverted the resources of our public health teams who've been leading this work. Um, so it has been significantly delayed. But in essence, what we do is we have a review team which is made up of, of public health professionals from both uh, councils. Uh, in general, we've commissioned an evidence review. We haven't in all of them, but in general, we've tried to commission an evidence review to look and collate the published evidence. The review team then bring that together with local data and intelligence. That is then presented to the academic advisory board um, who review it. They help pull out what the opportunities for action are based on the evidence. And then that's taken to the external advisory board, uh, which is made up of community representatives um, who then also add their lived experience and their, their views and feelings about the opportunities for action. And then that creates a series of opportunities for action, which is then what we bring to public engagement. So if we move on to the next slide. So today the focus is on the first three themes that we uh, have, have completed the review for. So the first is around racism, discrimination and the impact on health and well-being. The second on early years, pregnancy and parenthood. And the third on children and young people. And we have to be clear that through all of this, the opportunities for action, the work that we've done has been very much focused on what does the evidence say and what are the evidence based in interventions. So there are lots of areas where people had views on what they thought the solution would be, but we kept pushing back and going, where is the evidence? What is it that we can tie this to that shows this it works? Now, in some cases, we've been able to say, well, the evidence for this links to evidence in other ethnicities uh, or in other areas, and there's transferability. So we can say, because this works, for example, in improving access for service for disabled people by doing additional training and very specific training for staff, there's a theoretical basis that would justify making a similar recommendation around African and Caribbean health um, based on the evidence that says this is a barrier for access. So as you go, as we go through the slides and you reflect on what's being presented today, keep in mind that we've had to keep tying it back to where is the evidence, what is the evidence, and have we got a theoretical and a scientific basis we can tie the recommendations to. So we'll go into the first theme. 
So the first theme uh, we're going to talk you through is around uh, what we did around racism and discrimination and its impacts on health and well-being. Um, this theme was led by Lewisham um, and we've taken turns so each council kind of takes turns on who leads on which uh, theme and it's fair to say in this area the amount of research which is specific to African and Caribbean people in the UK is incredibly limited. Um, and that has made it really challenging to get really concrete in recommendations, but also to really draw out what the impact of racism and discrimination for African and Caribbean people is on their health and well-being in really tangible ways. Um, and, and that has been one of the real challenges in this particular theme. But it was an important one for us to start with because it allowed both boards to really talk about the reality, talk about their lived experience, which was also taken into account in forming the recommendations uh, and really kind of help us think through as we do some of the more, um, I suppose, topic based discussions, how we might pick this up and play this in. So I wanted to start uh, by just explaining why this is important and um, we know from more general research around ethnicity that individuals who exhibit um, experience racism exhibit worse health. Um, and that is um, interesting is that we also find that individuals who report it um, exhibit worse health than those that don't report it, which is a very interesting kind of balance. Um, and that racism operates at a series of different levels. Um, and creates barriers which are not just immediate, they can be long-term. And there is evidence of intergenerational impacts of racism, um, which was really powerful reading some of the literature in this. Um, and the impact of racism and discrimination can be uh, direct and it can be indirect. And, and that direct sense of stereotype and stigma can be that the individual um, experiences discrimination from, from a healthcare professional or from a social worker, for example, um, who's basing their assumption on what they can see of the person in front of them without having that conversation. Um, but it can also create internal stereotypes and stigma. And there are some evidence, uh, some evidence about how that in itself, that internal narrative that internalizes the stereotype creates a barrier for the person as well. And that internalized barrier can also then lead to a lack of trust, a lack of confidence, a lack of empowerment um, that creates barriers for people accessing health and well-being, but also barriers for them taking positive action and choices. There is, of course, unconscious bias as well, although the evidence base is interestingly getting more and more diverse about how you respond to unconscious bias. Um, but there is clear evidence that unconscious bias exists and that links to the, the stereotypes and the stigma as well. And then the final element of this, which was considered, was around the impact of racism in more structural ways. Um, and although I think this is something we see less evidence of in the UK than we do in other uh, areas around the world, but that concept of things like ghettos, where people are put into housing in particular areas because everyone in that area is from the same ethnicity, and that those areas are then not as well resourced with things like primary care, or transport or education. The most extreme example of this is probably in, the, in Australia with Aboriginal um, settlements and Aboriginal healthcare systems and Aboriginal uh, education, where those kind of structural barriers are built in, in effect, by the federal government. Um, so these are the kind of elements that we considered through the review. So if we move on to the, the next slide. So what we tried to do in these slides is summarise the evidence and in the final report there will be more detail and we're planning to also publish the supplementary evidence reviews uh, where we can as well. So when they publish in the spring there'll be a huge body of literature that kind of uh, is put into the public domain, uh, which I hope will be helpful for other people. Um, so the evidence highlighted that racism has a detrimental effect on health outcomes. 
uh, and that the impact is across many areas of both mental and physical health. And although some of these impacts you can explain through other socioeconomic factors, many of them you can't. And that therefore you come back to racism is driving poor health or one of the drivers of poor health. Um, this statement is around BAME because one of the challenges we had in this particular theme was more than any other theme, it was very difficult to extract African and Caribbean separate from other um, ethnic, ethnic groups. Um, but what there was evidence from that non-white British ethnic groups were more likely to have negative experiences of healthcare, um, that health services were less accessible, um, and those were a combination of insensitivity and day-to-day -day racism within services, but also on the other side, communities, individuals having low levels of health literacy. And when we talk about health literacy, we're not just saying this is people can't read and write. Um, health literacy is much more than that. It's about whether individuals understand the health system. They understand their rights within a health system uh, and how to navigate that health system. Um, and, you know, I think most of us know that some of this can be straightforward, even as a doctor myself. Um, when I'm sick and I have something seriously wrong, it can be quite difficult to navigate the bit, different bits of the NHS once you go past the GP. Um, to get everyone to talk to each other and connect. So health literacy is that concept both of understanding your own health and but also understanding the health system and what you're entitled to and what good looks like. There was evidence of pre prejudice within the NHS towards uh, ethnic, ethnic staff. Um, and if there's evidence of prejudice towards staff, there is almost certainly evidence of prejudice towards patients. Um, and overall, individuals who are from uh, non-white British ethnic groups who have other identity differences from the social norm, in inverted commas, um, experience more inequalities. So if you are African or Caribbean and lesbian and gay, the evidence shows that you experience worse outcomes than people who are African and Caribbean and heterosexual. Similarly, if you're disabled and and the way I would kind of describe this is if you think about each of those um, differences being a bit like a shopping bag, a uh, heavy shopping bag, and each one you've had, you, you've kind of got to pick up another shopping bag. And it just means you don't move quite as fast as people that haven't got any of the shopping bags or have only got one or two and you've got three or four. So that ev evidence of those inequalities. But overall, what we saw was that Although there was clear evidence of racism, there was very little evidence of people actually trying to understand what was going on beyond this very blunt term BAME um, and very little exploration of this within a UK context. So if we move on to the, the next slide. So when we took the evidence to the boards, um, we had some really interesting discussions. And um, the three kind of key things that came out from this was that language is really powerful and language itself can perpetuate stereotypes and discrimination. And we had a really interesting discussion with both boards actually about the use of the term black uh, in the context of ethnic coding. And that the use of the term black with black African, black Caribbean, black other compared to Asian, British Asian, Pakistani, Indian, where there's no colour in front of it. We put no colour in front of Chinese. Um, and yet we have this persistence of the term black uh, in front of African and Caribbean. Um, and also that that didn't reflect the reality of, at this bluntest term, people's skin colour in many of the countries. If you are um, someone who comes from North Africa, you are you may not have black skin you may not identify that word black may put you off identifying as an african although you come from an african country and that is your cultural um background um the second uh strong theme that came through was that we have to recognize that racism and discrimination are not things that just happen and go away 
This is not like just breaking your leg. These are things that um, people carry with them for years and often for lifetimes. Um, and that there was evidence of intergenerational impacts of racism. And the fact that we talk about racism and discrimination like it's here today, gone tomorrow, completely undervalues and undermines our understanding and our ability to respond to. And the boards felt quite strongly about this, that particularly for children and young people, we need to absolutely be much more honest and authentic in our discussion about racism and discrimination and recognise that it is a lifelong impact uh, and not something that's simply patched up and forgotten about. And then the final uh, key theme was around the oversimplification of ethnicity. And I've talked about that before, that this use of the term BAME completely limits our understanding of different ethnic identities. And it creates a level of racism and stereotyping by professionals that everyone who's not white British all behaves in the same way. Uh, it creates this kind of them and us in which the them is a huge block of people that are actually hugely diverse. But we've we've used these four letters to make it really easy to understand and tick a box. And that is unacceptable and inadequate in terms of addressing health inequalities. So those reflections led us to uh, develop some opportunities for action. And I'm going to run quickly through the, the four opportunities for action that came out. Um, so I'll run through each of them at turn and then we'll go to the mentee because we want your views about which would you prioritise? How important do you think there are? So the first one, if we go on to the next slide, is around decolouring data collection. So as I've said, there was a, a lot of discussion about this. The public service follows the ONS census data, which uses these terms uh, of black, uh, black Caribbean, black African. Um, and um, but we don't use brown, for example, in front of Arab or Asian. Um, we don't use a color word in front of Chinese. In fact, if if we put and this, uh, I'm thinking about whether I'm going to use the example because I feel it is so offensive and would be viewed as so offensive to put a color term in front of Chinese that you know actually just to say it is offensive. Yet we do it with black, and we don't. It, it's not thought about. But there was also a kind of flip side in the discussion that for particularly some of the older members of the group, um, black power, black empowerment, um, black had a much more positive resonance uh, for them. Whereas for younger members of the group, they didn't feel that at all. It didn't have that power. It didn't have that resonance. And, and their resonance was much more with African or Caribbean or other identities, but it w the black word was not a word of empowerment that was felt by a younger generation. And we see that in other communities within the LGBT community, the use of the word queer, for example, the use of the word dyke. Um, there's real generational differences about how people feel ownership of that language. Um, but there is also this sense from the, 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 the boards that actually using of the colour identification reinforces that ethnic identity is on the basis of the colour of your skin. And that that denies people's cultural identity so that if they identify as African but they don't have black skin, what does that mean? Um, so I know some colleagues are having issues with the slides, um, so I know the team will, will link with you in the chat. We are also going to share the slides and I'm talking through them. So if you can't see them, sometimes it's worth logging out, and logging back in, because if you could see them and then they disappeared, um, it teams can be sometimes a little bit temperamental. Um, so on decolouring data collection, the, the conclusion was there were a few felt that there is an opportunity for action to remove the term black from ethnic coding for African Caribbean communities in the public sector. So that simply means when you look at the list of ethnicities and the boxes that you tick, instead of it saying black African or black Caribbean, it will simply say Caribbean or African in the same way it says Pakistani, Indian, Bangladeshi, Arab or Chinese. Um, we would need to keep black other um, because that's a catch all in the same way we keep white other um, as a catch-all as well. but So that's the first recommendation or opportunity for action. Uh, if we move on to the, the next slide, 
The next slide comes back to that point about recognising that racism and discrimination is not here today, gone tomorrow. The impacts of those experiences can resonate across a lifetime. And particularly for children, there is an opportunity to make this much more explicit. So within the children and young people's world, we talk about adverse childhood experiences, things that happen to children in their lives that then resonate through the rest of their lives. Um, and we know that these adverse childhood experiences, people that have them face more challenges and often face more health inequalities. And if we know they're having them, we can do something about it and we can put in interventions to address it. So the review felt that it was important that racism and discrimination was explicitly included in the approach to adverse childhood experiences, both to recognise this in the assessment of children's needs, but also then to build on that to develop interventions and mitigations to try and break that lifetime of burden and try to help young people process that experience to be able to then make it move on in a more positive way. So hopefully that that is a clear one and links back to what I've said before. Uh, the next recommendation, as the slides move forward, is around being authentic in the discussion. So through the reviews, particularly in the discussion at the boards, there was a real sense that people were frustrated around equality and diversity training, that in the public sector it had been kind of stripped back to one hour's e-learning and the ethnicity was kind of two slides. And that was all ethnicities and that was inadequate and through our discussions there was a really strong sense that we needed to create safe spaces for an open authentic discussion about racism and discrimination to help people learn and understand but they also needed to recognize that there are differences between different ethnicities so the review was calling for organisations to review their training approach, that it becomes a core part of training that's delivered by diverse individuals, because that's one of the important things that the boards particularly brought out was that lived experience element, and that that created a space in which we could look at the diversity of cultural difference and not assume that all people um, from different ethnic groups are the same and they have the same experiences. Um, so that we've summarised that into being authentic in discussing the issues, but it's really about trying to say um, diversity and equality training needs to be better. It is not good enough to do two slides on ethnicity and combine all ethnic groups because you haven't got enough time. We deserve better. Um, and our communities and our citizens deserve better. So moving on to the uh, the next recommendation. So this was a recommendation around uh, understanding that diversity in more detail, and it builds on the previous one, but it talks more about in the context of education. And one of the things we did in building up to the review was try to pull together a report that um, explained the history of African and Caribbean communities in the UK and in Birmingham and Lewisham. And on one level, that's kind of was simple, simplified in a sense that you kind of go, there are big things like Windrush, for example, that happens. Um, but actually, when you unpick it and you really scrape back the surface and look in detail, trying to simplify even African and Caribbean, you know, two large clusters of countries, one a continent and one a very large group of different islands with different cultural identities, different histories, different experiences of histories, that this was a, an oversimplification. So the, the BAM as a start is a massive oversimplification, but we've also really recognised that even when you start to drill down, Africa is a continent. We don't talk about white Europeans like they're all the same and go, yes, actually the cultural beliefs of people and practices in Scotland is exactly the same as the people in South Italy because you're all from Europe. So the, the point of this uh, opportunity for action was really to try and work with education partners of all ages, and that's really from nursery through to higher education, university and degrees, and local communities to think about how ethnic diversity can be integrated into education to reflect diverse cultures. And that doesn't mean necessarily everyone goes to like 27 lectures on different cultural identities. It means if you're giving a 
uh, a lecture. I'm a, I'm a doctor by background. So if you're giving a lecture on blood pressure and you use a case study of a patient, today it might be a Chinese patient, tomorrow it might be an African patient. But when you do that, you are explicit about the differences in the culture. So that dotted through people's education is that more sense that different ethnic cultures have different beliefs, different patterns, different experiences, and you can't just homogenize them into a one size it fits all of white British and everyone else, because that's just not good enough. So those are the four uh, opportunities for action from the first theme. Uh, this is where I'm going to ask you to go to the mentee. And if we've got the um, got the mentee slide up, uh, have we got the mentee slide with the code for people? Oh, it's at the top. So if you go to the top, no, sorry, it's keep it there because it's at the top. Um, so if you go to www.menti.com and when it asks you for your code, put in 22433508. And first of all, just so you get a sense of um, how to use it. This is a slider. So it's just asking you, how do you feel today? So if you're feeling quite low, you're going to keep the slider to your left and you're feeling quite wise and energetic or creative, you're going to move it to the right. And when you've moved your slider, just click submit and it goes through. So we just give it a minute or two. And what you can see in the bottom of the screen is that little box. There's like a little person icon with a number above it um, that says how many people uh, have, have got it working. So we know that out of the 30 or so people on the call. Uh, it's 11 people now. It's clicking up. We can see, and everyone's pretty positive, which is really good. And I'm glad to see uh, on a on a day like today, where certainly in Birmingham it's beautiful sunshine. Uh, although I have to say, I am standing right next to a very big fan, uh, keeping me cool. Um, and I hope all of you have got some water uh, close to hand to keep you refreshed as we go through the morning. Brilliant. So I think everyone's getting a bit of a sense of that. What we'll do, because I'm conscious of time, and this was just a bit of an icebreaker to uh, give you a sense of how to use the mentee. Uh, Joe, if we can move on to the, the next question. So this should now automatically move you forward on your mentee screen. And this is asking you for the first recommendation, first opportunity for action, taking the black out of black African and black Caribbean on the coding. Do you agree or not? So if you strongly agree, take your slider to the right. If you don't agree, take it to the left. And if you're kind of in the middle, keep it in the middle. And we'll just give it a minute or so for people to use it. So that's great. So see 15 people have moved in. Often what you see with these things is also the people that feel really strongly one way or the other are right in at the start because it's quite easy to go far one way or the other. Others are, are more in the middle. Brilliant. So if we move on to uh, the next one. And this is uh, the question about do you support the uh, the recommendation, the opportunity to include racism and discrimination into adverse childhood experiences so into the definition the approach we take to children adverse experiences in childhood do you support us including racism and discrimination as an explicit thing to be considered in considering the needs of these children and young people And I should say on the data one, there is going to be another data recommendation, which comes, I think, in pregnancy as well, which drills even further into that discussion, um, because it is something that as we've gone through the themes keeps coming up that on one level, we want to get the language right, but also we need to know more detail about what's going on. Great. So if we go on to the, the next one, so number three, everyone's getting the hang of it now. So this is around the training. Um, and there's a quality and diversity training and getting more authenticity, more linking of that training to local communities and um, tying it more to actual broader discussions about what we're talking about rather than kind of ethnicity being crammed in alongside disability, LGBT issues, faith as well.
And I can see there's a, a comment in the chat from Jaskern uh, about the, the decoding is one aspect, but there needs to be something about considering the impact of your perceived visible diversity. And yes, that is something that I think in some of the other uh, themes is coming through uh, as well. Um, what's also interesting is if, and we see this in the Latino community, where they're not included in the census at all. So there isn't a box to tick if you're from Latin America. Um, and that complete denial of their existence means we've got no data on them at all. And, and yet they are quite a large population, certainly as large as um, populations like the Arab population. Um, OK, so I know some people are struggling with the PDF. We'll get that sent out by email to those that register Eventbrite is probably the, the easiest solution as well. So if we go on to the uh, the final one. So this is the point about education and whether you support work to integrate into education at all levels, more understanding of, of ethnic diversity and specifically in this context, more understanding about the history of African and Caribbean communities. Okay, last couple of people on this one. Brilliant. So now I think we'll go on to the, the final one, which is, I think, should be hopefully the most difficult question on Menti, if it's going across correctly. Oh, no. Where's, where's the prioritization one? Have we lost it, Joe? Don't worry, we might have lost it. We'll pick it up when we do. We'll do it at the end because we've got time to fix it before the end. Don't worry. Um, I can add that in, uh, Justin, and there is also it on Be Heard as well. All right, well, let, let's pick up at the end because I think it, we can do put all of them together into one at the end and get people to prioritise as part of the final exercise will okay. be sensible. So breathe now. That's the end of the first section. Uh, what I suggest is everyone gets up, have a bit of a stretch. Um, I'm at a sit-stand desk, uh, so you'll see me go down in a minute. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Avni and our team, who's going to talk through the um, the next review segment, uh, which is on early years, pregnancy and parenthood. Um, and then there'll be another set of mentees uh, towards the end of that. So keep your mentees with you. Um, grab a Grab a drink. And uh, over to Avni for the next section. And do keep popping the um, the uh, questions in the chat. I'll just pick up the point from Helen before I hand over to Avni. Um, the the point exactly, Helen asked in the chat, have you considered there are many people of Chinese, Indian, Middle Eastern origin in the Caribbean? Will we lose important equality data by removing the black? It's a really interesting question, actually, because at the moment, the census asks, are you black Caribbean, black African? So if you're Chinese or Indian, for example, um, at the moment in the census, we would assume you will tick the box for Chinese and Indian wherever you live in the world, rather than Caribbean. And if you're someone that say is second or third generation, Indian heritage that lives in the Caribbean, the question is, as you an individual, which way do you identify? Do you under, identify as a Caribbean first, Indian second, in which case you tick Caribbean, or you ident do you identify as Indian first, the country you live in second? Um, but because we use the word black in front of black African and black Caribbean, if you're someone who is of Chinese, Indian, or mixed heritage and you live in the Caribbean, you may not tick that box because you may not fit, you may feel, well, I've got black skin and I haven't got black skin, therefore I'm not, I can't tick that box. I need to tick other. And what we find in the census is more and more people are just ticking the other or mixed box, um, which doesn't really help us at all. So um, that's why we think it's an important opportunity. It, it shouldn't remove 
um, equality data. In fact, it should strengthen it because it's asking people what's their, the ethnicity they identify with, not bluntly what their skin colour is. And that's been one of the real discussions about this around uh, in terms of ethnic coding, that difference between asking someone what their ethnicity is versus their skin colour and that idea of ethnicity um, and cultural belief and practice. And as Dawn puts in the chat, that is, of course, separate to the discussion of racism, discrimination, which is often based on what we see. And that often is skin colour first. And we make a whole series of assumptions about someone, irrespective of their country of origin. It's simply what we see in front of us. But I'm going to hand over to Avni because as you're, you're seeing, these are really interesting discussions. That's exactly why we have the boards and we've been working through this. And I should say for the future themes that are coming, there is also a real opportunity for people to step forward, to be co-opted onto the boards for specific themes. So if you've got particular passion or interest in a theme, um, we'll put the link into the chat, but please do apply for co-option for that theme and bring your wisdom to the table. But Avni, I've taken too much of your time. I'll shut up and hand over to you. Thanks, Justin. Hi, everybody. My name's Avni Matharu. I'm currently the Public Health Programme Officer for the Governance Team in Birmingham for Birmingham City Council. Um, I previously supported the Birmingham and Lewisham Health Inequalities Review during my time as a Public Health graduate, um, alongside my colleague at the time, Dino Motti, the PH Registrar, and with D uh, Dr Justin Viney, and in partnership with the um, Lewisham Council. So today we'll be talking about the theme Pregnancy Early Years, and parenthood, which is the second theme for this review. And um, go to the next slide, Joe. Thank you. So ultimately, preconception and pregnancy health lay the foundations for life. Pregnancy is the very start of child development, and yet the mother's own health is influenced by social and genetic factors that can affect pregnancy outcomes. Um, there is consistent evidence of inequalities in affecting African and Caribbean women across a range of areas, and this will be discussed throughout the theme. Equally, parenthood is important, especially in setting life habits, foundations such as weaning, but also in the context of issues such as neglect, which can have lifelong impact on children's development and essentially what it what happens in pregnancy and early childhood impacts on physical and emotional health as well as um all the way up to to adulthood that is being affected um the image taken from the data database uh, data based on the maternal newborn and infant clinical outcome review 2016 and 18 presents if you're a black or asian woman you are five times or twice as likely respectively to die during your pregnancy in comparison to a white woman and with this disparity alone highlights why we're discussing this topic I can go to the next slide Thank you. And just for context purposes, the main Birmingham and Lewisham maternity providers are um, the Birmingham Women and Children's Hospital, the University Hospital, Sanwell and West Birmingham NHS Hospital Trust, and Lewisham primarily uh, served by Lewisham Hospital, which is a part of the Lewisham and Greenwich NHS Trust. Um, the data represented in the slides is a source from the NHS Digital Maternity Dashboard that collects patient information. Um, and it might have been mentioned before that the partnership between Birmingham and Lewisham has come together because we have demographic similarities and our deprivation levels are similar. Um, but considering the size of our population, um, both places, the proportion of births are not dissimilar from the percentage of mothers from black ethnic groups, which is interesting. Um, could we go to the next slide. Thank you. So a part of this review, we organised an evidence literature review to be done um, based on pregnancy, early years and parenthood evidence relating to African and Caribbean ethnicity data. Um, the evidence review highlighted the um, emerging themes that relate to inequalities in maternal pregnancy outcomes, um, healthy behaviours in pregnancy relating to vitamins and uh, vaccination uptake. Um, we know from the evidence the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency is higher is a higher concern in ethnic minorities. Um, maternity services, the evidence highlighted women attending antenatal care um, and the barriers affecting their experiences included um, things like language, uh, a shortage of interpreters, advocates for support and link workers, um, and even cultural attitudes towards male healthcare professionals um, can affect um, women's experiences 
experiences to um, accessing care and also um, women who are born outside of the UK even if English speaking may have a poor understanding of how NHS works and also have difficulty potential understanding healthcare jargon which can affect overall um, health experience. Also, meant, also highlighted was early years in terms of weaning and nutrition that we'll discuss shortly and the role of culture leads to the understanding of cultural competency and in terms of that we mean appreciating and interacting with people from different cultures and their belief system. Um, late bookings was also highlighted uh, and the evidence um, highlighted ethnic minority women were more likely than white British women to access services late and not have their scan by uh, by 20 weeks, which is associated with complications further in pregnancy. Um, and also the topic of breastfeeding and fatherhood um, emerge from the evidence that we'll discuss. And um, the issues of migrant women versus UK born women, the inequality outstandingly highlighted the di disproportionate effects of migrant women who have a higher risk of complications and mortality um, compared to UK born mothers um, during their pregnancy. Uh, the next slide, please, Joe. So in terms of inequalities in maternal and pregnancy outcomes, um, the evidence review highlighted the following. Um, increased maternal mortality amongst black women who are more than five times the risk of dying in pregnancy or up to six weeks postpartum compared to white women. Um, the risk of increased spontaneous abortion, stillbirth and neonatal mortality show babies of black or Briti black British ethnicity remain at over twice the risk of stillbirth and at increased risk of neonatal mortality. Um, the increased more uh, maternal risk factors related to 80% higher risk of severe maternal morbidity, including risk factors such as hypertension, depression, um, and also uh, vitamin D deficiency, as mentioned, and as well as black mothers presented higher levels of overweight and obesity shown in the evidence. Um, Labour experiences showed black African, Pakistani, and women of other ethnicities were significantly less likely than white women to deliver at home or in birth centres. And in terms of when we talk about early years, um, weaning, 52% um, of black parents had accurate understanding of the national guidelines advice compared to 86% of white parents. Um, the evidence highlighted black ethnic groups reported that they were more influenced by the advice given by previous generations of mothers and their networks in deciding when to wean. And the topic of fatherhood and the male partners, um, evidence explained that there is a negative representation of black fathers being associated with discrimination, racism and poverty and the negative stigma of the lack of involvement in care which will um, unravel in the um, opportunities, opportunities for action section. Um, the next slide, please. Thank you. So, um, so following the discussions with the academic and the advisory board based on the evidence literature, there were some underlying feelings that were captured based on pregnancy behaviours and the access to services, which related to um, the feelings of Trust and confidence uh, was associated with mistrust and uh, lower satisfaction of service support as qualitative and quantitative surveys have reported evidence on lower service satisfaction amongst black women compared to white women about maternity services. And this also relates to the um, ethnic uh, minority women relate, um, feeling the mismatch between women's expectation and the wishes for support that they experience when in maternity services. And also Asian and black African women are more likely to stay in hospital compared to white women and a longer stay is a reflection of increased need for care and also felt and, and um, discussed was the perception and experience of stereotyping and racist attitudes felt when um, 
uh, seeking maternity support. So this this ultimately has a negative impact and results in unhealthy um, behaviours such as um, lack of engagement in terms of late bookings, um, vac vaccine hesitancy relating to a wider understanding of feelings of discrimination by the healthcare system, and also um, early weaning and poor nutrition. It was also highlighted, highlighted by the board that these outcomes or behaviours are not decided choices, but more a case of they stem from a response towards a system that doesn't include you. And that's what was discussed during our during our um, discussions with the academic and advisory board meetings. Um, another common thread in the evidence showed language and culture, which Justin has kind uh, has um, discussed, but it was also highlighted that the service approach is a one size fits all approach and tends to ignore the importance of culture, language and the impact uh, and that impact of recent migration within the African and Caribbean communities. Again, the important uh, again, the impact of this relates to late bookings and delays to services um, and even poorer mental health. Again, from the evidence collected, black mothers are at a higher risk of depression compared to white mothers, particularly if they have immigrated to the US. UK and um, that's kind of uh, links to um, uh, less um, support within a network and also um, the support provided in the country that they have emigrated to. Um, next slide please Joe. Thank you. So now we want to look at the early years pregnancy and parenthood opportunities for action um, these had have led from the overall process of the evidence literature being discussed by the academic board and um, these uh, these findings have been shared with the advisory board and um, from these from those discussions, these outcomes have led to the following opportunities for actions that will that will go through now so um, the next slide for um, Thank you for the recommendation one. The board highlighted the importance and opportunity of influencing academic and professional training um, in terms of supporting wider learning to include important influential aspects of listening to people's experience and insights into how their body works and this relates to um, experiences of women who have shared how they have felt barriers to accessing pain relief and the stereotype of how African and Caribbean women perceive pain and the prejudice against um, women who have shared um, being young mothers. There's also the stigma against um, fathers and um, fathers and partners, as in the um, in the in the stigma known as the angry black man has a profound impact on maternity experiences for an individual and reinforces the stereotype of not being involved in care um, and also acknowledging the deeply ingrained unconscious bias towards black communities that could call into question how effective actually mod modified training will be and there's, there was also discussions in the boards about mechanisms for service users when in a maternity setting to understand how to um, clearly understand the pathways to report discriminatory behaviour. So from this discussion, the board, the review recommends update health um, person, professionals training relating to um, partner with local universities to develop uh, the curriculum for obstetrics and gynaecology, um, midwives and other health professionals to include the importance of cultural awareness um, and humility training, share lived experiences by service from service users and um, and more towards normalising, as Justin explained earlier, the authenticity of discussing racism in an honest and open way. So opportunities for action two. Thank, thank you. Um, this was titled Data Collection by Ethnicity and it was highlighted in the meetings. If you are not counted, you do not count. The boards expressed how a lack of data on ethnicity is a long-standing issue, um, and there needs to be there needs to be some action towards this. In particular, it was highlighted how the NHS uh, five-year forward plan um, has highlighted that perinatal uh, mental health as, is an important issue, but because of the lack of data on ethnicity, it kind of actually um, counteracts. Um, 
counteract the uh, targeting of the system's efforts. So the review has identified the limitations of um, ethnic coding in maternity services, given the different cultural beliefs and practices in different countries. And these are oversimplified, as discussed before, into African and Caribbean ethnic groups. And there is a clear need for accurate collection and disaggregation of data by detailed ethnicity and to include the nation, nation of birth and origin including in women's um, experiences and perinatal mental health issues. So um, action three, um, details a, a comparative national pathway database, database. So there were discussions around building an online resource tool to have available information on different countries' health pathways. This was kind, this was to um, help fill the gaps in terms of aligning with the mother's country of origin. Um, it helps with the gaps and aligns with the NHS system and highlights support for women of recent migration. And it was also highlighted that there, with, with a tool like this, there can be issues because of mixed um, and private systems not always having the same standard of care. And the advisory board also highlighted if um, a tool such as this would only be effective if it was incorporated cultural and religious aspects to be included. And there was a strong quote from the board that was quite powerful, stating there is a rigid interpretation of what health is, while women believe their behaviour is healthy for cultural reasons. And as understood, we understand how cultural and traditional aspects really impact health for women from ethnic um, my, from ethnic backgrounds. So the review, understanding this, the review um, recommends a comparative national pathway database, um, builds, on, uh, builds an online tool that can allow health professionals to rapidly access and um, compare pathways of different countries with the NHS guidelines to identify potential misalignments and support recent migration um, to navigate within the NHS. And the an extension of this is uh, recommendation four, um, resources on traditional ideas and cultural practices. Um, it is an extension of the previous recommendation in terms in terms of emphasising the need to include the importance of culture and tradition in African and Caribbean communities, which we know impacts health, by providing resources on traditional ideas, um, cultural practices, by, for example, de delivering content to health professionals, as mentioned, provide readily available translated resources and interpreter supports to advocate health, and to essentially build trust and support during health consultations um, with health professionals. So the review recommends resources on traditional cultural practices that complements the national guideline tool for from recommendation three and with um, to include information on cultural practices tradition and um, beliefs of different ethnic minority groups um, Recommendation five um, was titled See More People Like Me. This discussion relates to addressing the issue of trust, the confidence in the health system by the service looking like its users in all aspects. Um, it was highlighted how there is a benefit in terms of trust and reliability if health professionals and related support are from the same background as their community patients. Um, the board recommended utilising local targeting of comms, working with grassroots communities, to build trust, um, influence and engagement with, mar with marginalised communities and how current work is being done on um, including the views of local communities needs to be communicated better and to show that it is taking place and producing results. So the review recommends to ensure that communication is representative of the community to build trust, to bridge the gaps and um, the bridge the gaps of the community and reduce any linguistic and cultural barriers preventing um, um, an improved service. So recommendation six, um, continuity of carer uh, related to the evidence identified by the 2016 Cochrane Review explained women who had consistent care throughout pregnancy and birth from a dedicated midwife team were less likely to have complications associated with preterm births and needed fewer interventions during labour 
with their care when their care was shared with different health professionals, obstetricians, GPs and the midwife team. And the NHS long term plan explains the continuity of care is linked to significant improvement in clinical outcomes for women from black, Asian and other ethnic minority communities um, and also including those living in deprived areas. Um, the review recommends uh, the review recommends the to work be conducted alongside local maternity systems to ensure continuity of care is rolled out effectively and outcomes are measured and sustained. And recommendation seven for opportunity of actions. Um, the report Better Birth highlights that women should be able to make informed choices that are based on evidence, as well as open and honest conversations with their health professionals. Uh, this information should be delivered in a way that is accessible and takes into account individual circum circumstances and needs for um, example, a limited understanding of English or cultural factors. And this was taken from the 2019 survey of women experiences of maternity care. Um, the review recommends there, there was positive evidence relating to breastfeeding, there was less positive evidence on diverse cultures, practices regarding weaning and early years uh, support and a clear need for greater understanding of cultural differences and culturally tailored support and resources. So there, sh there should be a specific consideration um, in early years provision to ensure that parenting and specifically weaning support programs are culturally appropriate for African and Caribbean parents. Um, I appreciate that was a lot of information that is given to everybody. Um, I just wanted to come in and ask if Justin wants to comment on anything before we move on to the mentee. I, I think, I think the, only thing, the only thing, oh, and I've sat down sat now, down which now, is why it's lower. It's lower. Um, um, I think the I only think thing the I would thing say, say Avni, you probably need to mute because we've got feedback. Got feedback <clears throat> I think the only thing to say is you, know, the evidence is shocking. Um, actually, and, and and as we went through it, you know, some of the evidence is quite old as well. Um, and these inequalities are unacceptable. And that's why we're doing the review. That's why we're drawing some of this out. Um, because actually, you know, the, the partnership that we have is about trying to shine a light on this and find ways to, to improve it and address it. Um, and you, many of these issues sit with different organisations, the NHS, particularly in terms of maternity care services. Uh, and you know, unfortunately, there aren't a huge amount of levers in the system um, to tell them what to do. That's not the way that the, the public sector works. So by identifying these issues, by drawing out these recommendations, and all of the, the recommendations feed into the Health and Wellbeing Board, which has the NHS on it, um, as a full member. So the idea is that when the report is finally published, these opportunities for action will be put to the Health and Wellbeing Board in both areas and the NHS will have to respond to them and will be asked, what are you going to do about this? And are you going to accept the recommendation or have you got a reasonable argument why you can't and why you think this inequality continues? So this is about holding the system to account and it is about trying to address them. Um, and I think it's really important we you we do that in the spirit of how we change things for the future and keep moving things forward um, and, and see this process as part of trying to shape that and move that forward. But I think part of that now is the mentee, isn't it, Anthony, to, to be able to get people's uh, feedback on them. Yeah, can I ask who is... Um, uh, Joe's, Joe's got the mentee. mentee. So, Okay, so the early years and pregnancy parenthood um, section, um, if everyone still joins, it's still the same code, 2243 3508. Um, if we want to move to the next slide. So on in terms of the um the first uh, opportunity for action, seeing um again quite strongly people's views on um, updating maternity um, and health professional training learning for the wider learning that was discussed. We can see more people. So 
So the discussions that happened around the um, within the academic and the advised group based on the literature evidence, it came through really strongly during the discussions about um, how how people felt of their personal experiences being shared through um, their maternity experiences on how um, they felt that their voice wanted to be heard during their their time in a maternity service and that again it's that the system is kind of built on a one size um, fits all approach and it's a case of how we um, incorporate wider learning into um, a community that is not homogenized but has individual needs do we have the uh, a timer for each um, mentee oh, okay thank you so the next um the next um, recommendation around data collection by ethnicity. Um, again, if you are not counted, you do not count. And that was, um, again, how Justin explained about the language and how that is complemented by um, the data. That is an important aspect that gives actually the, the understanding and the outcome of how we proceed with interventions and and where the data actually lies and how it actually affects communities in terms of where support is needed. So far, everyone's kind of in agreement, which is. Which is positive to see. And then should we move to the next? Uh, thank you. So the Comparative National Pathways Database, again, this was a proposed idea that came up during the academic and advisory board meetings with, um, it was a almost a proposed idea to align the gaps between women who have immigrated from an, another country to, again, how we support them during the NHS um, during their time with the NHS service support and how we can align the two together and also emphasizing and highlights what is missing and the and the gaps to support um, women and their partners from the country of birth or country of origin from when they've come to that ultimately has an influence and effect on their pregnancy outcome and behaviors and again that kind that um, leads into the the early years period as well of that experience. And what was strongly mentioned during that meeting was the, the aspect of this will be reliable in terms of when there's um, when there's a religious aspect and cultural aspects that are included. Should we move on to the next next question. I think this stays open, doesn't it, for some time if people want to think about it or come back to it. But um, again, the the uh, recommendation four was on again supporting the previous recommendation about it's about emphasising that important aspect of inclusivity in terms of ensuring that culture, tradition, beliefs, support for um, um, women who have recently migrated um, and that have or that have limited network support um, when they are when they are here and going through the NHS pathway system. So again, supporting resources um, to support not only um, health professionals, but women and partners themselves that are involved in the maternity services.
Yeah, should we move on to the next one, Joe? Thank you. Again, that um, again, the recommendation talking about see people, see more people that look like me. Um, that really emphasised the um, the uh, that community um, welcoming, that community inclusivity, and how that can have an impact on someone's um, individual experience. So just with recommendation six, apologies, I think there was a confusion with the with the slides, but recommendation six is about um, supporting women who have recently uh, migrated or support refugees, asylum seekers that have um, that have uh, that are requiring support. Um, this topic during the meetings, actually, um, it was um, because we uh, because of limited time and the complex and diverse uh, conversations that were happening we actually base this recommendation on the um, maternity actions by the race equality foundation um, and uh, these recommendations were shared with the academic and advisory board post meetings to get their um, to get their input and their opinions on this on this recommendation and, and to ensure that what um, to ensure that every stage of our review was transparent so the recommendation Recommendations were discussed around the um, to protect pregnant women from the risk of relocation, um, sufficient asylum support, um, allowing purchases beyond prepaid cards, and um, women being protected against eviction, eviction and those um, asylum claims that have been refused. So this is the recommendation that we're that we're putting forward based on the um, Race and Equality Foundation. And I can see that many people feel strongly about that um, from the result. And then recommendation seven, going um, back to the weaning and early years, um, as um, mentioned before, uh, um, this is uh, influenced. This period of time is influenced by um, communities and previous generations within African and Caribbean communities. That has an important and influ influential impact um, on a decision of when mm -hmm. weaning is um, taken place compared to what is suggested by national um, NHS guidelines. Um, so it's an important factor to um, include in terms of um, support that we can um, support that we can equally understand and also provide um, information appropriately. OK, um, I think that's done for this topic. Um, thank you very much for um, um, for listening to uh, this theme and um, hearing some of the rich and complex conversations that happened with the academic and advisory board. And um, this is an opportunity of the, for reflection of what we've done so far. So it's really good to hear some of the comments made and I'll pass over to Justin. Great, thank you, Afni. Um, so what I suggest is we take a, a four to five minute break uh, just to pop to the toilet, grab a cup of uh, cold iced water. Uh, and if we come back at uh, 22, 
then we'll go on to the final session we're going to be presenting today, which is the findings and the reflections on the impacts on children and young people from our African and Caribbean communities. Um, so really good uh, feedback in the chat and actually some real evolution of some other thinking uh, we need to draw out as well as we move forward, which is exactly the reason for doing this. So great everyone's engaging and also using the mentees. So uh, see you in five minutes, grab something cool to drink, stretch your legs, and uh, we'll be back at just past 22 for the final section, all right?
Great. So hopefully uh, everyone's had uh, a refreshing uh, break, had time to pop to the loo and refresh yourself, stretch your legs uh, before the next one. Can I just check, Joanne, are you with us? Are you ready for, for the next round? Morning. Yeah, yes. I can see. Hi. All right. So I'm going to hand over to Joanne to take us through the uh, the next section of the review. Do you want to switch the slide for us, Joe, please? Perfect. And if you want to go to the next one, I'll be ideal. Thank you. OK, morning, everyone. I'm Joe Bradley. I'm the Public Health Service Lead for Children and Young People here at Birmingham City Council. I'll be taking you through the next set of slides focused on children and young people and what the review has found and the recommendations for action that it proposes. Um, just so you're aware, Joe, I can't see the slides, so I'm just depending on you, really. So um, next slide, I'm assuming. OK. Right. Yeah, Joe, can you just move the slide for me? That's it. Perfect. Thank you. OK, so as you're probably aware, um, Birmingham has a young population with more diverse backgrounds and higher levels of deprivation compared to the rest of England. So over 40 percent of our population are aged uh, 0 to 25. So children, people um, and their health is a key priority for us and for our colleagues in Lewisham. And we know that negative experiences early in life um, can lead to poor outcomes. So for those children and people who continue to face additional challenges as they grow, whether these are children with disabilities, children in care, or those who face other experiences of adversity, we know it can have a neg negative long-term uh, consequences impacted on their learning and future mental and physical health and wellbeing. However, evidence also shows us that positive experiences in children and people's lives impact across their life course and form the foundations for better performance in education and in later life. So when we look at the percentage of African and Caribbean children and people in Birmingham, Lewisham, we can see that there's a very similar numbers um, percentages with uh, Birmingham having slightly more black African um, young people than Lewisham. Um, next slide, please, Joe. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to um, reiterate uh, some of the information I'm going to share now is prior to the death of George Floyd and the additional highlights that we've received since then are the risks and inequalities experienced by black people that has happened since then. So the findings for this review come from a literature review and rapid evidence summary rather than a full sy systematic review. It's just not possible within the time resources available to, to be able to do that. So some childhood um, health issues such as asthma, routine vaccination uptake will appear underrepresented as well as causes of ill health known to disproportionately affect African and Caribbean children, such as sickle cell disease. So other health and social issues may be underrepresented here, including over, um, you know, black young people's overrepresentation in the youth justice system, the proximity to or involvement in serious violence, and children and young people's experience of racism and its health impacts. So that said, from the completed evidence review, it's my job today to share the topics that have been considered and the findings. So first up, we've got mental health and wellbeing. African and Caribbean children and your people generally reported higher levels of poor mental wellbeing than their white counterparts of the same studies that were looked at. A report considering access to healthcare within our youth offending services found that black and ethnic minority young people are overrepresented in the youth justice system but then they're underrepresented in referrals for health support. So the researchers have suggested that stigma regarding help seeking may be a driver and that mental health indicators are more likely to be missed and misinterpreted for these young people. When we think about COVID-19 and mental health and wellbeing, we know that the pandemic and response has had an inequitable impact on black and minority, minority ethnic households. So when we're looking at mental health and wellbeing during this time, we can see that there were higher increases reported for depression in young people from non-white ethnicities. We can also see these young people have shown greater increases in seeking help for their mental health during the pandemic than white young people. And it's been identified that family activities, cultural integration are having um, 
such as having ethnically diverse friendship circles. And this has been shown to have a protective effect around mental health and wellbeing, which is really positive. When we think about health risk behaviours, research shows us that engagement with a variety of health services may be lower in Black African and Caribbean populations, including our uh, immunisation, uh, child and adolescent mental health, and being registered with a dentist. So this causes a variation um, which includes um, the causes of this uh, not engaging with uh, health services could it be around culture, language and a prior experience of health services. When we're looking at risk behaviours, cannabis use, um, uh, mental health difficulties and strong peer or neighbourhood affiliation were associated with risk taking behaviours. So we have white and mixed ethnicity young people reported higher levels of substance misuse than black young people. And when we looked at sexual risk taking, Caribbean young people were most likely to report having unprotected sexual activity. In a seven year study in a London uh, genital urinary medicine clinic found that black British and mixed ethnicity teenagers were overrepresented in their cohort of teenage pregnancies. And that's compared with the studies clinic population. One paper found that black adolescents engaged in fewer risky behaviours than white adolescents, despite them having higher levels of risk factors within their environments. And from the research that was looked at, African young people generally had fewer risky behaviours than Caribbean young people. When we looked at obesity, African and Caribbean children have higher rates of overweight and obesity, but poor African and Caribbean children are, uh, seem to be at a lower risk of obesity than higher income children. One of the papers which assessed dietary behaviour found that African and Caribbean children had low intakes of fat, saturated fat, dietary fibre, vitamin D and calcium compared to children of other ethnicities. One study that looked at dietary behaviours specifically around skipping beef breakfast and fruit and vegetable consumption. And they found that skipping breakfast at age 11 or 12 and at 21, 22 was associated with a higher BMI and again, at 21 20 to 23 years old, with uh, higher cholesterol. So both behaviours were common to all participants, but highest in African and Caribbean groups. Physical activity levels were not lower in children, but what they did find was that a lack of knowledge and awareness about physical activity for children prevented parents from promoting it. And they identified cultural factors that may affect parents' engagement with out-of-school physical activity interventions. An evidence review by um, Public Health England reported that a lack of qualitative evidence examining the prevention of ex excess weight in older children, particularly for those living in poverty and ethnic minority groups. So there's a lack of information around how to prevent excess weight. When we looked at education, we found that African and Caribbean children on average reported higher levels of aspiration than white children in multiple areas, including higher levels of um, aspiration in um, getting into school, higher education and, and what they wanted to do with their lives through their occupation. Some of the contributing factors to this was um, being a young woman, having possible mental well-being, positive school conduct and uh, parental aspirations as well. Yet Caribbean pupils on average have lower levels of academic attainment. And research identified that Caribbean, Caribbean children and people are three and a half times more likely to be excluded at primary, secondary and special needs schools. Caribbean and African children are less likely to be entered into higher tier examinations by teachers than white children, even when prior academic attainment is equivalent, thus capping their outcome grades. High achievement by black children was associated with a range of individual family and school factors. So some of the individual factors included good attendance at school, completing their homework, aspiration to, extend, uh, to continue in school beyond the GCSE, and the development of resilience factors to counter negative school experiences. Family factors associated with a high achievement included maternal education, employment and um, parental involvement in children's education. And then some of the key school factors um, result in, in high achievement by black children were the strong leadership of a head teacher, a culturally diverse workforce, valuing and celebrating cultural diversity, an inclusive curriculum, pride in Caribbean and African ethnicities, reflection on achievement of Caribbean and, and um, African pupils, 
a multicultural school population, the recognition and celebration of cultural diversity and of black cultural identities within a school setting, all really key. And one paper considered the overrepresentation of Caribbean pupils in school exclusion statistics, and it identified a number of factors um, that could be important in why this might be happening. And they included the meaning of racism in schools, teachers' expectations, institutional racism, a lack of diversity in the school workforce, including teachers, educational psychologists and SEMCOs, and a lack of effective training on staff of multicultural education, diversity and race issues. A qualitative study of 60 young people found that young Caribbean men's early exposure to adult styles of policing on the way to and from education settings. So setting that scene and um, and the beginning and end to your day. So, um, so the adult styles of policing may create feelings of unsafety and social exclusion. And we looked at um, care and support and we found that um, black children on average are overrepresented in the care system. In more deprived areas, there's a lower proportion of black children who are looked after or on a child protection plans, more so than um, less so than white children. But in less deprived areas, a higher proportion of black children than white children have social care interventions. So explanations for that include racial discrimination, which informed assumptions about parenting practices and black families being more visible in less deprived majority white areas. Next slide, please, Joe. So this slide is a reflection from both the academic and advisory boards on the research read and discussed. And they identified that we need um, transition interventions specifically from nursery to primary school, primary to secondary school, and then of course into young adulthood. We need locally culturally appropriate services included in schools, ensuring the capability, support and trust to engage and meet the specific needs of these young men and young women. We need to consider the breadth of education and targeted academic interventions. We also need to consider sexual and reproductive health of young people, include taking into account sexual exploitation um, and gender specific interventions, including things around um, rape culture. So um, I'm sure you're all aware of the Everyone's Invited website as well. So making sure that we're addressing um, issues on there. We need to be addressing the disproportionate levels and impacts of economic deprivation for African and Caribbean families, including low pay for frontline workers within our respective organisations. And with regards to violence and safe spaces, we need to be considering the direct and indirect impacts and risks, essentially our contextual safeguarding responsibilities. So understanding that identifying somewhere as unsafe, this creates barriers and that might be barriers to accessing public um, spaces um, and uh, somewhere that uh, creates, uh, seen as somewhere creates barriers that might be things like uh, positive health opportunities, trying to get into your parks. If the scene is unsafe, then you're not going to want to go there to do your exercise. And if we think about air quality, joining up the support of leaders at a range of levels to address that, and also ensuring we're addressing some of the quick win opportunities as well as the more longer term options. So short term interventions on road traffic incidents and ensuring there are opportunities to support children and people living with sickle cell disease. Next slide, please, Joe. I'm just going to check in. Uh, OK, where are we? Right. I just wanted to see where we are. It's so difficult when you're doing this. OK, so my reflection of the findings. The review recommends the following and the opportunities for actions going forward. So action one, intervention and support at key transi transition periods. We've already mentioned it. These are from nursery to primary school, from primary to secondary school, and then into from secondary school into young adulthood. And they should include greater guidance to parents on applying for secondary schools, more information provided on progressions and development, designated support liaison officers to be identified and guidance on websites to be improved to support this. And we need to be partnering with colleges and sixth form colleges to provide information to students about financing, including student loans and grants, ensuring that they're fully aware of what their options and opportunities are. And the review recommends that councils and schools are to work together with local organisations to support all of these actions and a review of funding and support around the commissioner of services needs to take place. 
We need to be working alongside grassroots organisations who have access to and the trust of parents and carers. We need to include offers of summer schools for core subjects and any programmes with children and young people to include parent and care involvement, especially if we're co-designing services. These are the things we need to be thinking about. Next slide, please, Jo. OK, this is about action two, mental health of children and young people. Caribbean children appear to have more socio-emotional difficulties than white children, and this is largely explained by the relative socio-economic disadvantage of their families. African and Bangladeshi adolescents scored significantly higher for well-being against perceived social support than their white counterparts. So based on this, the review recommends that councils and partners are to work with culturally appropriate services, including those in school, to increase capability, support and trust. And we need to engage services who support the specific needs of our African and Caribbean young men and young women. Next slide, please, Joe. Action three, education and risky behaviours and with a, a focus on sexual and reproductive health. So black, um, black, we found that black adolescents engaged in fewer ris uh, risky behaviours than white adolescents, that African adolescents engage in fewer risky behaviours than Caribbean adolescents, and that um, Caribbean adolescents had the highest rates of unprotected intercourse, which were compared to white and mixed race um, adolescents. On these findings, the review recommends that the council and its partners review the breadth of education and targeted academic interventions. And we need to review sexual and reproductive health services for young people. And we need to ensure that they include information, help and advice that is culturally tailored and includes education on gender equality and consent, includes information around sexual exploitation, gender specific interventions and rape culture. Next slide, please, Joe. And this is the final action, action four. So when we've been looking at safe and appropriate spaces, they've looked at direct and indirect impacts and the risks, so barriers to accessing positive health and opportunities such as parks. There are interventions already in train around low traffic neighbourhoods and school streets and evaluating those to measure health impact on African and Caribbean children and young people. It's really key. So the rev based on that um, research, the review recommends that the council and its partners should work with existing youth provision to offer different opportunities within existing contracts, identify community centres or spaces which the community can use work with black owned businesses and linked um, to socioeconomic issues and ensure short term inventions on specific issues or exposures where African and Caribbean children and people suffer inequalities such as road traffic accidents. So if you're still with me, um, next slide please Joe. Our children and young people opportunities for action are focused on um, four areas, um, just a reminder of those four areas and uh, that offer children and people opportunities for action and as discussed they are focused on intervention and support at key transition periods, addressing the mental health of children and young people, a focus on education and risky behaviours and also thinking about sexual and reproductive health in there and ensuring safe and appropriate spaces. So, um, Justin, anything from you before we um, start asking people for their priorities and going over to Menti? Um, I think the only thing to, to add, and I know there's been some comment in the chat on this. So through each of the themes, we try different ways of engaging citizen voice. So in the, this theme, which was led by Lewisham, there were a series of additional focus groups with specific groups of children, young people from African and Caribbean backgrounds. Uh, in the maternity strand, we ran a survey, an online survey specifically asking African and Caribbean parents to contribute their views. Um, so we, we're trying different methods with each theme, and that's part of the pilot approach to try and find different ways. But that's also why we're doing this bit of the process, which is about putting these draft opportunities for action into the public domain so that people can feed in their thoughts and help refine them and develop them. So that's exactly why we're doing it this way. Um, and we've also put in the link, I know some people have joined us at different points during the day, um, the link to the website, which gives you the membership of the boards. Um, so you can see some of the people that sit on them, but also information how you can apply if you want to be co-opted for a specific theme. But anyway, on to the, the final mentee moment. 
Great. Thanks, Justine. Um, so, yes, our final mentee, um, where we can capture views on what we should prioritise. So what's important from your perspective? Um, the numbers up there, 22433508. Um, so let's look at the first opportunity for action, and that is around intervention and support at key transition periods. 8.79, somebody's pushing that. Like I'm commentating a race. OK. Brilliant. So on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you support intervention and support at key transition periods? We can see that's obviously really important to people. And so it should be. Excellent. Thank you very much. Jay. Thank you. Um, so action two, um, a focus on our mental health of children and uh, young people. We know that this has been um, a concern across the board during COVID and I can obviously that's reflecting in your responses to this as well. So a key element of um, action for us, absolutely. 9.8. Perfect. Cool. Just give it a second. I can, I feel a 10 coming. No. Oh, that's sad. OK, um, thank you. So um, action three, education, and risky behaviours. Um, don't be shy. OK, this is, yeah. How do you support this action? Is this something that you feel we need to be focusing on? And I suppose um, what hasn't been discussed and what could be included in here would be around um, youth violence and child exploitation as well. So um, I don't know if that would change your viewpoints, but um, it's I'm sure going forward, it would certainly be a consideration for us. Thank you, Joe. And then the final one is about safe and appropriate spaces. Key if we want people to go out and enjoy the space that they want to, to be in and live in, thinking of safe communities as well as the safety of children and young people, just safety for all really. I'm thinking about our contextual safeguarding um, opportunities for this and engaging with those wider spaces that can help children and young people feel safe is key. So that's great. I can see that, you know, having to pick um, a favourite action um, is very difficult. So hopefully um, I can see that all of these are really relevant to everybody and, uh, and are key pri priorities. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Jay. So I think that the final one on this mentee is just give us a bit of a where are you in terms of how are you feeling at the end? There's been a lot of information um, thrown at you, uh, a lot of opportunities, though, to kind of feedback through the mentee. Lots of stuff in the chat, which we save. So we've got opportunity to reflect on that uh moving forward as well and that all feeds in and there's also the link uh to the survey which we've shared with you so we hope it's been really helpful way of of kind of explaining where we're up to putting it out there now before we get to the end because it's an opportunity to influence it and to inform as well joe if we go back to the slides i think we've got to flip into a slightly different menti code haven't we uh, right. So again, if you go to uh, right. So if you can uh, close this, the other one, I'm not sure whether it will let people come out. Let's see. That's the problem with Joe doing everything is we end up with this. Great. So if you go into Menti again, so basically whatever window you've got it in, close it down, reopen it, go www.menti.com and put in five five eight seven eight two three six and what we're asking you to do now is rank so thinking about what we've talked about under each theme which one do you put first which one do you put second which one do you put third or fourth because one of the things we want to try and get a sense of is how people feel about which order they should be done in um kind of what they're all important but we have to kind of if we had to prioritize if we had to make a decision 
and we could only do one or we could only do two how would you prioritize these because it, you know as barbara says that there's lots of cross-service activities there's lots of opportunities and picking a favorite is really hard um but kind of we need you to do it and have a go there's no right or wrong in this but it does help give us a bit of a sense of um you know what where you would put your bang for your buck if you if we only had a hundred pounds to spend on this where should we spend it which one would do you feel strongest about in terms of would make the the most impact and the most impact um both in the short and the long term and that's one of the things that we've tried to think through with these opportunities for action is also thinking about not just what are sticking plaster solutions because frankly we've had 30 years of sticking plasters but what will actually change things for the next decade or two and that means they're probably quite difficult things to do and they won't happen overnight but if we don't talk about them we don't start working on them we're not going to ever we're going to be able to change it so that's why we've got this this approach so I think pretty clear steer for this one. If we can go on, Joe, to the next next question. So again, this is for the ones that are around uh, pregnancy uh, and maternity. Um, and where where would you put your bang for your buck uh, in terms of ordering these? Brilliant. This one takes a little bit longer um, because there are more of them. But the nice thing is, as you do order them, they get less on your app. So it becomes a bit easier to do. Brilliant. OK. And what's interesting as we go through this is you do start to see some, you know, there are some differences, which is really helpful for us around kind of planning and emphasis. So if we go on to the, the final one of these. Which is brilliant. So these are the ones around children and young people. Great. OK, brilliant. Thank you, everyone, for that. So if we can go back to the slides, Joe. Great. So I'm just going to talk finally about the, the next steps and where we go from here. So um, the, the first thing on the next slide is the, the link to the survey. We've put it in the chat as well. Uh, it runs until the end of August. Please share it with with your networks. You, we want to get as many people as possible to feed into that. Um, there's opportunities to do things like we've done today, where we, you're asked to kind of rank things, rate them. But there's also free text boxes where you've got space to kind of tell us what you think, where you think we might have missed things, where we can strengthen things. Um, but it's a real opportunity to help shape this. Um, we will be hoping to run some more of these sessions um, over the summer as well to give other opportunities. Um, and I'm really keen we look at can we also run some very specific ones. So I'm going to be working with the team on how we can run one of these specifically uh, for young people from our African and Caribbean community, because it's a really important part of, of them having a voice and, and making the 
extra effort to enable that voice to happen. So we'll be that's something I will commit that we will do explicitly in this phase. Um, so on to the next slide. Um, so the plan is that that next year is when we publish the final report. That doesn't mean we're waiting until the final report is done. Um, as we go through this, as we pull out these recommendations, um, we start to look at them and we start to say, can we get moving on any of these faster um, or not? And again, as you feed into us and tell us what you really support, what you don't, we flex and we learn on that. Um, we've still got quite a lot of uh, themes to go um, and they alternate between Birmingham leading and Lewisham leading and if you want to get more involved do email us but there's also the information on the council website about how you can apply to be co-opted if one of those themes is something that you're really passionate about um, and you want to be around the table as it's discussed you know and the co-option is something we introduced uh, I think in the last theme on healthy aging which we've just completed um, and it was really useful. People who said, I can't commit for the whole thing, but actually this is a topic I'm really passionate about. Um, and I can come to the table for the, the two meetings that this involves and I can commit what's probably about 10 to 12 hours worth of reading and preparation over a month long period. So it wasn't a huge ask, but they could say I can do that, but I can't do that nine times. So um, the co-option thing is something we introduced uh, this year, which I think is really good opportunity for people to get involved. Um, so I think that probably brings us uh, to a close. Um, I'm not sure whether Council Hampton has been able to stay with us. I know there's been some uh, urgent council business that she's had to be uh, dropping it, dropping in and out of. Um, so I think she may not be with us at the moment. Yeah, I just checked she's not. Um, so then it falls to me to say thank you, everyone, for your time today. Thank you for contributing. Um, I can see from the chat uh, people have given some positive feedback about actually how it's been uh, really interesting and useful uh, and feeding into us. So um, thank you for your time. Please help promote the survey. Um, please keep engaging with us as we go forward. Please look at co-option. Um, you know, I do think this is a real opportunity to do things differently. Someone said, you know, some of this ev evidence we've known for years. But what we've never been able to do is really turn it into action at scale that truly changes the experience for African and Caribbean people living in our city, living in Lewisham, living in the country. And the commitment that we've made to do this work is a commitment which is about focusing on how do we stop that and not come back in 10 years time and those inequalities haven't moved. We need to turn these into actions that matter, that they change people's lives and that fundamentally they close the gap for these communities. Um, and so I hope you found it inspiring. I hope you found it exciting. Some of it will have been depressing because none of this is easy reading. Um, but I hope you you are engaging with us and you see this as a light and an opportunity to make a real difference. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, finally, a big thank you to the team, particularly my team in Birmingham, who pulled the, the slides and stuff together this week um, and have really done a spectacular job um, pulling together really some quite complicated discussions and distilling it down. So thank you to everyone uh, and I hope you have a, a very good day. So thank you for your time and goodbye.